All right. Hello again, everyone. Uh, now we're in uh, Chapter 23. Uh, we're going to look at monetary policy theory. And so here's what we want to look at. Well, what should a central bank, the Fed maybe in particular in our situation, what should they do in case of various different scenarios they might be confronted with? So, for example, they might be confronted with uh, shocks to aggregate demand. They might be confronted with shocks to the long-run aggregate supply curve, or they might be confronted with shocks to the short-run supply curve. And so let me run through uh, one example of each of these kinds of situations to illustrate how the Fed might, uh, might work. And what we'll see at the end is that, well, gee, it looks like the Fed is uh, well able to at least mitigate some of the issues brought up in these situations, but that they also face, it turns out, uh, important timing issues in terms of actually conducting their policy. So the first situation we want to look at is a negative demand shock, or in other words, a decline in aggregate demand. And so as you can see, there'll be a number of possible uh, reasons for this. We could have a decline in exports. Uh, we could have a decline in consumer confidence, which reduces consumption, uh, or any number of, of alternatives here. You know, consider, for example, in 2007 and 2008, what we saw was a number of uh, problems in the housing market that spilled over into financial markets, and that in turn spilled back yet again in, in a feedback effect in terms of consumption uh, and investment. So we saw a number of negative effects here. And so what we want to uh, think about is this. Well, what should the Fed do if faced with weak aggregate demand? And it seems fairly straightforward that what the Fed should do is pursue an expansionary policy because, after all, monetary policy is almost tailor-made for weak aggregate demand. Consider, for example, the little pun here, the Taylor Rule, where we saw in that video, remember, that we could go through an example and demonstrate that with uh, weak aggregate demand generating low inflation and low GDP growth, that should call for a relatively low value of the federal funds rate. And as we'll see here in just a second with a, a simple chart, that if the Fed is able to, to time things correctly and so forth, well, they can prevent or maybe at least mitigate the decline in GDP and also prevent any declines in inflation from becoming deflationary. And so what we can do is flip over to our first graph here. And so notice how I've got things set up. So initially, the economy started off at full employment at an inflation rate of pi zero and at the full employment level of GDP. Then along came some negative aggregate demand shock, for example, a decline in investment and consumption, uh, again, for example, here. That shifts the aggregate demand back to the left. If left alone, in the short run, the economy would reach an equilibrium at a lower level inflation, pi one, and a lower level of real GDP, y one. Well, here, what the Fed can take advantage of the fact is that expansionary monetary policy works to increase aggregate demand. So the Fed could reduce the federal funds rate target. That would tend to lower overall interest rates in the economy. That would work to stimulate consumption and investment and other uh, economic variables. And that would work to shift the aggregate demand curve back toward the right, back toward the initial equilibrium. And if the Fed was able to time its actions correctly and do actions of the correct magnitude, it's pretty clear to see that the Fed would be able to move the economy back toward its initial equilibrium, or in other words, stabilize the economy and prevent the GDP decline from being more, more longer lasting than it would be otherwise, and prevent the inflation from possibly becoming deflationary. So again, it looks like the Fed is just perfectly suited to combat or deal with an aggregate demand shock. Now what if the Fed is faced with a different sort of problem? What if it's faced not with a negative demand shock, but a negative supply shock? And not just any negative supply shock, a permanent negative supply shock, meaning one that affects the long-run aggregate supply curve. And this might be, for example, an, an oil embargo that happened in the uh, early 1970s, or maybe possibly, say, a decrease in the overall population. Those factors would tend to shift the, both the long-run and the short-run aggregate supply curves back to the left. And so now the question becomes, what is it the Fed ought to do? So let's consider the outcome where it, it does nothing. In other words, the economy is simply left alone to stabilize itself. Well, in that situation, what we'd observe would be something like this chart right here. So the initial long-run equilibrium was at this full employment level of real GDP and this level of inflation. Well, along comes this negative supply shock which forces the long-run supply curve and, 
by implication, the short run supply curve back to the left. Those factors work together to constrict supply within the economy. That tends to push up inflation and simultaneously push down real GDP growth. So if the Fed did absolutely nothing, the economy would reach in an equilibrium, a long run equilibrium at a relatively higher inflation rate and a relatively lower level of real GDP. So now if we need to think about, well, what should the Fed's options be here? Well, they could pursue, they could of course do nothing and leave the situation as is, or they could pursue an expansionary policy, or they could pursue a relatively contractionary policy. Well, the expansionary policy, of course, would tend to move the aggregate demand curve to the right, just like in our previous example. The problem though, the Fed can no longer, and this is the big deal here, the Fed can no longer obtain this level of real GDP permanently, because that's now unattainable due to the leftward shift of the long run supply curve. The difficulty here is the Fed cannot any longer attain this level of real GDP. It's sort of stuck with that new level of GDP, at least in the long run. So if it pursues an expansionary policy by increasing the aggregate demand curve to the right, it would be pretty easy to see that we'd end up with excessive inflation, even more so than we already have, but wouldn't do anything to restore long run GDP. But what the Fed could do, however, is it could uh, institute a contractionary policy and stabilize inflation back toward the old level, because for example, Pi 1 might be higher than its target. And so by pursuing a contractionary policy to reduce aggregate demand, that would tend to shift the aggregate demand curve back to the left and it would be relatively easy over time, at least according to our chart here, to move the inflation rate back to its target. Now, this might take a little bit of time to actually occur, but the Fed would be able to stabilize the economy around the old level of inflation, high zero, and at the new equilibrium level of real GDP. Again, the crucial point here is this, the Fed cannot do anything about the new lower level of real GDP. It can, however, do something about the relatively high inflation rate by pursuing the appropriate policy. So the Fed's actions are somewhat a little bit more limited here. So again, the point here is we cannot permanently any longer increase output and employment, but we can deal with inflation. That's our bottom line takeaway here. Now suppose we have a temporary negative supply shock. The difference now is that we don't have any long run factors in the economy changing. We just have some temporary factors changing so that only the short run supply curve shifts. So for example, suppose there's a temporary increase in firm production costs. So the idea here is that only the short run supply curve would tend to shift. And so what we would observe would be something along these lines here, the short run supply curve. I have not correctly completed my graph. Let's see if I can do that. The short run supply curve would shift back to the left like so. And in the short run, we'd observe relatively higher inflation and relatively lower real GDP. So this would be uh, a situation where uh, both uh, problems uh, are subject to the Fed's possible actions. So here, it's unclear exactly what the Fed ought to do because we have higher inflation and lower real GDP. Well, suppose the Fed tried to fight the uh, decline in real GDP. If it decides to fight the decline in real GDP, what it would tend to do is pursue an expansionary policy. So if it wanted to move GDP back toward Y star, you'd pursue that expansionary policy and they might in fact be able to, with an increase in aggregate demand, move output and employment back toward Y star. But notice the problem here. The problem is that they have made the inflation rate increase. So they've stabilized, at least on first appearances, real GDP, but they have destabilized inflation. The inflation rate is higher than it would have been otherwise. The alternative, or another alternative anyways, is the Fed could act to stabilize the inflation rate. 
So suppose that the inflation rate of pi one was viewed as undesirable. Now what they would have do, of course, and I won't draw the picture because it would make our graph a little too complicated, is they would tend to shift the aggregate demand curve back to the left by pursuing a contractionary policy. And that contractionary policy would surely tend to reduce the inflation rate. But the problem is, of course, is that decline in aggregate demand would exacerbate or make worse the decline in real GDP. So here's the idea. No matter what the Fed does, if it pursues an expansionary policy, it makes inflation worse. If it pursues a contractionary policy, it makes the decline in real GDP worse than it would be otherwise. So maybe, just maybe, the optimal decision here is to at least appear on first appearances, do nothing. But what the Fed can actually do is instead of actually pursuing an expansionary contractionary policy, it might just need to do something as simple as this. Commit credibly to keeping the long run inflation rate at its target level of pi zero. This will help keep long run inflation expectations under control. And one of the things we learned about that influences the short run average supply curve is in fact inflationary expectations. And so by credible communication, to keep long run inflation in check, what will happen over time is that the short run supply curve will tend to shift back toward its original position. And when it moves back toward its original position, we see a decline in inflation and we see an increase in real GDP until we get back to our long run equilibrium. And so if the Fed is able to credit credibly commit to stabilizing inflation in the long run, that temporary decline in the short run aggregate supply curve is a self-limiting process in terms of its influence on output and in terms of its influence on inflation. Oops. There we go. So this is where credibility becomes very important because if the Fed is able to credibly communicate to the public that inflation won't become out of control, that it will revert over time to its target level. That will prevent the short run supply curve from shifting further to the left and will in fact uh, influence it to shift back to the right, back toward its original position. So summary so far. So we investigated three different shocks, one demand shock and two supply shocks. And it seems, at least at first glance, that the Fed is able to not completely eliminate a problem, but at the very least mitigate economic problems. Well, the difficulty is that, among others, the Fed has inter problems in terms of timing. And what we want to see here is not only are there timing issues, that sometimes it has difficulty shifting, for example, the aggregate demand or the aggregate short run supply curve by the amount that it wishes. So sometimes policy changes don't transmit fully to the economy. Now that's an issue for another uh, video, but what we want to look at here is the timing issue in terms of the, the Fed's actions. So in life, of course, timing is very important. It's no different with monetary policy. Consider, for example, uh, what we call the data lag. Data on the economy take time to arrive. Consider quarterly GDP. That's only released four times per year. So it comes out very infrequently. Plus, it takes about a month for GDP, say, for example, in the first quarter to be released. So the first quarter is January, February, March. First quarter GDP data are not released until about the end of April in the United States. So it takes a whole month after the quarter is over to get information on it. But there are monthly data, employment, inflation, and other pieces of data that come on a, a monthly basis but even still, there are some lags that sometimes are weeks long in terms of getting those data as well. So it takes time for data to arrive on the doorstep of policymakers. But still, once the data arrives, that doesn't solve the, the situation here because we have now what's called the recognition lag. In other words, it takes time for policymakers to recognize that there's an actual problem that they might need to deal with. The issue here is we need to see patterns policymakers do before they take action. You don't necessarily want to take action if you are the central bank or if you are running fiscal policy on a few bad months worth of data or say one bad quarter. Maybe you need two bad quarters or maybe you need five or six months worth of data 
to recognize that there is some problem that you might need to, to deal with. But the point here is that you need to wait until you've got this pattern, and by which point your problem has been uh, in existence maybe for several months or possibly even longer. But now surely you think, well, okay, now the data have arrived, now we've recognized that there's a problem, now we're done. Well, unfortunately, no. Now, though, we have to actually decide what the heck to do about the problem. Well, central banks, like the Fed, are usually pretty fast. They just need to have a meeting or so, which might not even need to take place in person, so they can decide relatively quickly. So they have an advantage over fiscal policy where governments, especially democratic governments, usually take some time to decide what sorts of policy actions they might want to pursue. So finally, you think, well, now we're good. Now, finally, they've gotten the data, they've recognized there's a problem, and they've decided what to do. But now, unfortunately, once they've decided what policy to pursue, there's what's called the implementation lag. It takes time for decisions to actually take place. So central banks on this front are relatively fast. If, for example, the Fed decides to pursue a contractionary policy, it can very quickly call up the trading desk at the New York Fed and have them execute that policy on the very same day. So central banks can do that stuff really fast. Well, governments, again, especially democratic ones, take a while to actually implement their policies to, for example, change taxes or to change government spending. Those can drag on for months or possibly even years. And then last but not least is this, is once you've gotten the data, you've recognized there's a problem, you've decided what to do, and you've implemented your solution, one last problem you run into, the effectiveness lag. Your policy actions are going to take a long time to actually impact the overall economy. To, for example, change aggregate demand, meaning changing consumption behavior, meaning changing investment behavior, meaning changing behavior of, say, for example, exports. These things take time to occur. Financial markets, interestingly, react pretty quickly. So if monetary policy changes, stock prices might react right away, interest rates might react right away, exchange rates might change quickly, and so forth. But the underlying real economy, consumption, investment, exports, and so forth, those sorts of behaviors are much more slow in terms of their overall effect. Those things might take months or possibly even years to react to a policy change. And so clearly the point here is this, because of all of those lags, there can be really long delays between a problem and when a solution actually starts to impact the economy. Consider, for example, our most recent financial crisis. Until 2008, September 2008, there was a pretty modest response on the part of the Fed. They did do you know, some policy actions, but not very dramatic. By then, the underlying problems in the financial market and eventually the economy became very severe. They were able to move really quickly once they discovered these problems. And even the federal government moved very fast. For example, the TARP uh, bill was passed in October of 2008, and the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act was passed in February 2009. And for the federal government, those are really pretty lightning fast actions. However, even still, their effect in this lag is going to be a problem because the change in monetary policy, which impacts interest rates, for example, will take time to impact consumption investment. Changes in government spending and taxation will take time to alter consumer behavior and firm behavior. So again, these lags might be months or possibly even years. So wrapping up here, under certain circumstances, the Fed might in fact be able to do a pretty good job at mitigating effects of negative shocks to the economy. Well, the circumstances that we need are getting the timing right, and unfortunately, uh, this is easier said than done, and also getting the magnitude. Again, that's also a little bit more difficult than might be at first glance. Thank you very much.